Does anybody here have a roller coaster relationship with relationships? Like a love hate relationship with relationships? I, I recognize them, I, I can only really speak for myself, but there's just this reality of there's components of relationship, like Pete shared a couple weeks back, that it's, it's why we do what we do. It's fulfilling, it's exciting, uh, it's, there's so much joy in it, but there's also a component of relationships that's hard and discouraging and frustrating, and so we kind of go back and forth. I know for me, there are times where I feel utterly alone and I can't stand it, and then there are times I want to be left alone. I don't know if you ever felt that way or kind of go back and forth with those emotions. I know as parents, if you're a parent, you know, your kids can be a source of great joy and excitement and encouragement, but also a source of great worry and frustration and difficulty. For honest spouses, honest spouses could probably speak to one another and say, you know what, I love you. I just don't really like you right now. If you're honest, you've probably been in that place as a married couple. Um, I recognize that for myself, I could just, I could be in a place where it's crowded with people, it's super exciting, like, oh, there's so many people there, this is awesome, and then go out on the street and be disgusted that there's so many people there. I think about if you go to a, a baseball game or something, and if it's a packed stadium, and there's all that energy, and it's great, all these people, and then you got to go to the parking lot. And everyone's like, where do all these people come from? I wish there weren't so many people. It's like this back and forth roller coaster reality, the pendulum effect of relationships. And they exist because of sin. They exist because of brokenness in our world. And here's the truth. I'm difficult to live with, and I imagine you probably are too. We are people. We struggle, and we're hard to deal with. But here's a thing that we cannot escape. God wired relationships into the foundation of the human existence. God made us for a relationship. We were talking about this Wednesday night in men's ministry, this idea that God is self-sufficient. He needs no one else. He did not design us because he needed us. He didn't need to be completed or fulfilled. He was complete, perfect in himself, in his relationship, as Father, Son, Holy Spirit. He did not need anyone else, yet he chose to create us, and he chose to create us to have relationship with him. You think about when God made Adam, God did not ask Adam to come up to the heavens and spend time with him. God came to the earth and walked with Adam. And God spoke of Adam and said, it's not good for man to be alone. It's an interesting concept. I don't know if you ever thought about it. We used to watch a show called The Last Man on Earth. And in the early episodes, the real early episodes, they were very entertaining to me because I just started thinking about what would I do? If the world was my sandbox and I didn't have to think about anybody else and what happened, I'd find an Indy car somewhere and drive St. Petersburg and race. I would go to every football stadium in the entire nation and try to kick a field goal. Like, just do whatever you want to do. It's free. It's open. So in the show, this guy does some of those things. He, just, he needs some groceries. So he drives into the grocery store, not to it, right in, grabs some groceries, backs the car out and goes wherever else he's going. It's just humorous stuff to me. Like, what would you do if you're the only person on the earth? But he continued to put out signs hoping that somebody else existed. I think we can find ourselves in those places where we maybe like some alone time, but the truth is we're built for relationships, and we should fight for them. Relationships matter. God wired us to have relationships, and they should matter. And I think about all the things that I contend for, all the things that I fight for, is not often what God fights for. You think as it progresses, God, even in the brokenness of our sin, God said to the nation of Israel, I will be your God and you will be my people and I will live among you. And then Jesus, God in flesh, Emmanuel, God with us, God came to walk among us. And Jesus was asked the question, Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus said the greatest commandment is this, love the Lord your God with everything in you. Have relationship with God. And the second is like it, love each other. Relationship. Foundational to the greatest commandment is relationship, relationship with God, relationship with one another. And when we close the story of man on this earth, God will develop a kingdom that includes na- every nation, every tongue, every ethnic group, celebrating and worshiping together, living together with God with us again. 
relationship. It's foundational to our human existence. And think about if it matters that much to God, why does it not matter that much to me? And too often, we're quick to brush relationships aside. If somebody bothers us or offends us, frustrates us, they just write them off and find somebody else or move on. But God cares about relationships so much so that he would fight for them. And I believe that what the heavens celebrate is when we contend for relationships too. And when we're willing to do whatever we have to do to fight for not only our relationship with God, but others' relationship with God and our relationships with one another, to contend for that. There's a story of Jesus that we read about Jesus, and I think it's one of the stories we resonate a little bit more with. And sometimes you see Jesus in his perfection. It's hard to you know, recognize I'm so far away from who he is. But the story when he goes into the temple and starts flipping tables and kicking people out, that's the Jesus I really resonate with. That's the Jesus that I'm like, ah, I can be that Jesus. But what we don't recognize is that it was calculated. That wasn't a reactionary moment. The scripture tells us that Jesus went to the temple the day before. He saw what was occurring, went home or went wherever he went to rest, and then came back the next day and did that. And the reason for his response was that they were making it hard for people to get to God. People who wanted to get to God couldn't get to God. And if you want to upset the Lord, make it hard for people to get to God. That's what he cared about. And it's why he shares the story that we talked about last week where he challenges the religious leaders to recognize that your wealth and your status doesn't make you a citizen of heaven. And what you're teaching the people and potentially keeping them out of the kingdom of heaven is damaging, and I don't like it. In fact, Jesus would make a statement to the religious leaders, you go the whole world, you search the whole world to make a single convert, and you make them just as much a son of Hades as you are. It matters to him that people would know his father and that they would have a relationship with one another. We see a story that we're going to dive into this morning where he makes some similar bold statements, but it shows his heart for relationships. Jesus said to his disciples in Luke 17, 1 through 2, things that cause people to stumble are bound to come. But woe to anyone through whom they come. It would be better for them to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around their neck than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. So watch yourselves. Jesus says that stumbling or uh, offenses, they're going to come. You're not going to dodge it in a broken world. But he says, woe to the ones who bring them. Woe to the ones who cause any of my little ones to stumble. And little ones is not speaking about children. In Matthew, he says, any of these little ones who believe in me. It's those who are pursuing Jesus. Think back to where this whole interaction started. Jesus is drawing sinners and tax collectors. They're interested in repentance and change. And the Pharisees and religious leaders are pushing them away. They're finding restoration to their heavenly father, and the religious leaders are trying to push them away. That is not cool with Jesus. So he says, woe to those who keep people from getting to the father. Woe to those who create stumbling blocks. The word that is used there is the Greek word from which we get our word scandal. In its most basic form, it literally means a bent stick, and it spoke of a stick that was used to set a trap. So envision maybe a box or something like that that has a stick underneath it that an animal would trip and then that trap would fall on them. Jesus says, woe to those who set traps, who ensnare others and ensnare them for things that are not leading them back to the Father. It matters to him. It's not the only place that he uses the word. He shares a story about a man who had a field. And his enemies came in and he planted weeds in the field and his servants asked, should we pull up the weeds? The master says, no, wait until the end to the harvest, then we'll separate. And the disciples ask him, well, what did that story mean? What was that parable about? And Jesus says, well, the one who sows the good seed, that's me. The field is the world. The good seed, when it's accepted, creates children of God. The weeds are children of the devil and The harvest is the end of the age. 
And what he's saying is that woe to those, there he says woe to those that God will separate those who plant the weeds, those who cause others to stumble, same exact word. What I recognize there, and, and this is just a side note challenge, somebody shared this with me before, according to that story, Jesus says, to the, the master says to servants, wait until the harvest. It is not your job or my job to determine whether somebody is weeds or wheat. It's not our job to determine whether somebody's a believer or not a believer. God will separate that. We develop all these ideas of, oh, I'm going to figure out, oh, I don't know if they're truly a Christian. I, that's not my job. My job is to simply tend the field, to continue to see the good seed of the gospel communicated. Jesus uses that term there, stumble. Paul used the same term. When he wrote to the Romans, he closes his letter. He says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them. He's speaking about teaching that would pull people away from knowing Christ and finding the Father. He says, same word, stumble, snares, traps, woe to those who cause you to stumble. And it's not just people. Jesus would speak about things. In Matthew 18, Jesus says, if your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands and two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell. Now, Jesus is not calling us to self-mutilation. The truth is we can reject him without eyes, without feet, without hands. We don't need those things to reject him. What he's saying is that his eternal destinations matter... And what we do to help promote that in the lives of others matter. If anything hinders that, get rid of it. Get it out of there. If anything keeps people from finding God, again, you want to upset the Lord, keep people from finding his Father. It matters to him. Relationships with God matter to Jesus a lot. They should matter to us. You know, I recognize for myself how much I contend for things, I fight for things, but so often it's not contending for others in their relationship with God. More often than not, it's me contending for my comforts, for my rights, for me to prove that I am right, contending for my own securities. Whatever it is, I fight for a lot of things, but do I often fight for other people to know God? That's what Jesus contends for. For him, people knowing his father was crucial. And he says, woe to the one. It would be better that they suffer a tragic physical death than that they keep somebody else from finding spiritual life. Because our eternal existence matters more. And we should fight for relationships, not just our relationship with God, but the relationships of others with God. I recognize that there are things in our society that are worth fighting for. But I fear that we would sacrifice the souls of people on the altar of our desires. That in order to make the world the world we want it to be, we would be okay if it was that world, even if others didn't know God and ended up in Hades. That's not what Jesus contends for. The truth is, if our world is as broken as it is, should that not compel the gospel all the more? If people are as messed up as they are, should that not compel the gospel all the more? If the world is really coming to an end, should that not compel the gospel all the more? Instead, we fight for how do I make sure my comforts are protected? It should propel in us a heart for the gospel. If I truly believe this is the end of the world, it's the end of the age, it's coming, I should preach the gospel. Because others need to know the Father and be restored in their relationship with him. That's what Jesus cares about. That's what we should contend for as well. Jesus cares not only about our relationship with God, he cares about relationships between us a lot. He goes on, he says, if your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them, and if they repent, forgive them. 
Even if they sin against you seven times in a day and seven times come back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive them. He shifts gears a little bit. And I only say he shifts gears because the terminology is different. The tone is a little different, at least in the language. So earlier he spoke about those who set traps. That word stumble is a snare. Here he says, if anyone sins against you, it's a different word. It's the word that most often means to fall short, to miss the mark. And what he's saying is somebody misses the mark that God had for you relationally, rebuke it, address it. He doesn't say ignore it, brush it under the rug, address it. We as believers, and I do think he's speaking to brothers and sisters in Christ, we want to address all the sins of those who don't have the Spirit of God in them. We need to address each other. Because contextually, in Matthew 18, he's speaking of the church. It's the same conversation that he's having that Luke's recording here. It says, when my brother or sister sins against me, I am to address it, rebuke. The same thing that Paul wrote about the Scriptures. All Scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for correction, instruction, training, rebuke, all things that we should do as believers, not because we're self-righteous trying to stand over somebody saying, I'm better than you, but because we care about their relationship with God and we care about their relationship with us. The most loving thing I can do as an individual who cares about somebody's relationship with God and their relationship with me is to address what is actually going on. But notice he says, if they sin against me, not if they hold a different opinion from me, not if they disagree with me, not if they offend me. It's not what he says. If they sin, if they miss the mark of God, then I address it. I want to point this out. Notice who he says they should go to, who we should go to. When somebody sins against us, who do we usually talk to? Everybody but that person. Listen, we are trying to shape a culture here at CFC, and I hope if you approach me with something, I hope my response to you is seasoned with grace and salt and mercy and love. But if you come to me in an email or text or even conversation and say, so-and-so is doing this thing, my first response is going to be, did you talk to them? And if your answer is no, in a very seasoned with grace, salt, merciful way, I'm going to say, then why are you talking to me? Because we are trying to shape a cultural understanding that our pattern as believers is when somebody sins against us, we speak to them first, not everybody else. It's the pattern that Jesus gave us in Matthew 18. Go to them. And if they repent, forgive. It's over. And the word forgive literally means to send it away. I love, the, I love that terminology. I love the imagery. In the Old Testament, the Israelites would have what was called the Day of Atonement. And on that day, the priest would take a lamb and he would ceremonially place upon that lamb the sins of all the people. And they would send that lamb out of the city, out of their community, as if they were sending that sin away. That's what we do when we forgive. We send it away. We don't put it down in a ledger. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 13, love keeps no record of wrongs. Love doesn't say, well, on September 19th, 1982, you did this thing, and I can't wait till you do something else because I'm going to point you back to that day you did that thing. It sends it away. I love how Alistair Begg says, he says, forgiveness means three things. It means I'm not going to bring it up with them anymore. I'm not going to bring it up with anyone else, and I'm not going to bring it up with me anymore. That's what it means to send away. Forgive. And Jesus says, if they've repented, you forgive them. If they don't, then you find somebody else who could say, yeah, I see that in your life too. I challenge you because I love you. I love your relationship with God. I love our relationship. I want that to be healthy. If they repent, it's over. It doesn't get to me or the elders or anybody else in the church until those two steps have happened. But he does say forgive. And in their cultural setting, they believed that if you forgave somebody three times, that was very noble. When Peter asked Jesus, how many times should I forgive my brother? Seven times? It was like he was saying, I'm more noble. Jesus says, no, 70 times seven. 
Here he says, if they sin against you seven times a day and come back and say, I repent of that sin, forgive them. What he's saying is that our forgiveness as brothers and sisters in Christ for one another should never run out. Now, when you hear that, because I know when I hear that, I think that's not possible. So did the, the disciples. Relationships need the help of God. When Jesus says forgive, even if they've sinned against you seven times in a day and every time they come back and repent, but you have no, no source history, no context to lead you to actually believe their credibility, forgive. So the apostles say to Jesus, Lord, increase our faith. It makes sense to me. Jesus is telling me to forgive over and over and over and over again. God, you're going to have to help me then because I can't do that. I need your strength to do that impossible thing. Increase my faith. Help me. You're asking me to continue to forgive. Increase my faith because you're asking me to do what in my mind is impossible. So I need the strength of the God of the impossible. And I love that Luke says the apostles said that. Every other time he's talking about these 12, he speaks of them as the disciples. Why did he choose here to say the apostles? Well, Luke's writing to a Gentile, non-Jewish audience like you and I, and I think what he's saying is even they struggle with this. Even they wrestle with this concept of contending for relationships so much that forgiveness is without measure but continue to forgive. And Jesus replies and says, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. What he says to them is you don't need a greater measure of faith. You need to tap into the faith you already have. Whatever measure of faith you have, it's enough to say to a deeply rooted tree, be uprooted and not only be tossed in the sea, I want you to go to the sea and root yourself in the sea. That's how powerful your faith is. Why? Because it's in a person, the person who is the God of the impossible. And in truth, the greater acts of faith in life are not moving mountains and uprooting trees. The greater acts of faith are loving when we don't want to love. The greater acts of faith are forgiving when we really have no reason to forgive. But yet Jesus says, if they come back and sin, you must forgive. It's not, it's not a suggested thing. It's a command. So we say to God, God, help me, because I can't do that. But the truth is, the Spirit of God is in you if you believe in Jesus Christ. The same Spirit that raised God from the dead. The spirit of freedom and victory and love and life, that spirit is in you. I recognize my body is failing, my soul and flesh are weak, but the spirit in me is alive. And with the spirit of God, all things are possible. So what I need is not a greater measure of faith. What I need is to cling to and tap into the strength that is already in me in the spirit. To offer forgiveness and contend for relationships. And Jesus goes on and shares a story that seems disconnected, but I think, I think we'll see that he's addressing the same idea. He says, suppose one of you has a servant plowing or they're looking after the sheep. Will he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit down to eat? Won't he rather say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready and wait on me while I eat and drink? After that, you may eat and drink. Will he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? So you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, say, we are an un- unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. Now, Jesus is not devaluing us. But contextually, in Matthew's account, the whole, this whole discourse started. Did I lose my bad? Oh, this whole discourse started because the disciples were fighting about who's the greatest. Perhaps, as he shared with them, contending for relationships, offering forgiveness, fighting for people, they thought, well, if I do that, I'll gain more favor from God. Jesus says, no, you're just being obedient. You're not doing this to receive something from God. A servant doesn't expect to get something better by simply doing what they were tasked to do in the first place. I'm not worthy of more. I did my job. 
And as followers of Jesus Christ, we are called, commanded to contend for our relationships with one another. Not because we're seeking more favor. Here's the crazy thing. God is a God of favor who would say to us, I no longer call you servants, but friends who would continue to pour out blessings and rewards on our following or pursuit of him and give blessings in his inheritance. But the truth is, all we're doing is saying, because of what you've done, Lord, and my obedience to you as my Lord and Savior, I will do that thing. Not an expectation, but in response to you. When Peter asked about forgiveness, Jesus shared a story about a man who had a huge debt that he could never repay. He asked for mercy, and his master forgave the debt and sent him away. He then later found a group of guys who owed him a much lesser sum of money. And they also cried out for forgiveness and mercy, but instead of forgiving, he mistreated them and threw them in prison until they could repay him. He didn't get it. He didn't get that what he had was the grace of his master, the mercy of his master, the forgiveness that his master had shown him should spill out of him to others. We recognize that because God contended for our relationship, we should contend for the relationships of those around us. Relationships are messy. They're hard. But they are foundational to the human existence. And I believe the heavens celebrate when relationships are restored. We go back to where this all started. Jesus shared the story of the prodigal son, the lost sheep, the lost coin. The heavens celebrate when what are gods are found. Lost relationships restored. And we should celebrate that as well. I just wonder, I've been thinking about this for myself. What would it look like if in every interaction I was actually contending for that person's relationship with God rather than contending for what I want or desire? What would it look like if I truly had a heart for them? I think about, uh, listen, we all have tough interactions. I, I share this, so I don't get too deep into it. I play basketball over in Lebanon a few times a week, and there's this one guy who comes out on a certain morning, and he, I believe in all honesty, he's a male model. He's super fit, real long blonde hair. The problem is he comes in with like, uh, he's got a jersey on, but it's, it's half cut. His abs are showing. He's like, I respect, I, yeah, I respect what you did. That's a lot of hard work, but it's like, we're a bunch of old dudes. We don't really, you made that. You didn't buy that that way. You made that. You cut that shirt to come play basketball so we could see your abs. And I was just kind of struggling with it a little bit. And right out the gate, I'm like, I just don't like this guy. Don't think I like him. And then later, we get into playing basketball. He's playing help defense. I beat my guy, go around, and he just shoulder charges me. Calls a foul, but then says, that stuff's not happening here. I'm like, you didn't even make a basketball play. Now I really don't like this guy. And I'm thinking about, stepping back from that, thinking about, I made an assessment of this individual because he's got a tube top on or whatever. I made all this assessment, and this is how I view him. And I'm not thinking about, I'm more contending for me having a status on a basketball court than contending for him as a person who needs to know God. That's a silly example, but we have those all over the place. A couple Sundays ago, my, my three-legged dog ran around the corner. I'm half asleep. He ran around the corner barking at somebody, and all I hear is this lady screaming curse words, put your bleep bleep dog on a leash. This, everything in my mind is thinking, put your mouth on a leash, Karen, and I want to go down this whole tirade. And, and then I'm thinking, like, I'm the pastor in the community. She's going to find that out. But the problem is we don't contend for relationships. We contend for our own Securities, our own comforts, our own image. That's happening all over. It's happening in the church. It's happening with the people of the church. We're contending for our opinions. We're contending for our, the world that we want. We're contending for all these things. What if we contended for people to know God? What if every interaction you had this week relationally was, I am fighting for this person to know their father? Whatever that takes. I just think we would react differently. I think we would pursue relationships differently. I want to be that person. Lord, help me. Increase my faith because I cannot do these things without you. God cares about relationships. Both relationships with him and relationships with one another. Let's fight for them. 
You for it? All right, let's pray. God, I thank you that you cared so much about us and having relationship with us. You would send your son to pay the ultimate price to carry the guilt and the penalty of our sin to a cross, to bury that and to come back to life, to give us opportunity to have new life, to be restored with you, that one day we will walk with you again. But until that day, you put your spirit in us. You live within us as followers of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that we would be passionate about a world knowing you. That the broken relationship that those around us have with you, we would be passionate about restoring. And that in those moments, we would put aside our own comforts, desires, pursuits, and make that first. Lord, I pray that if we have struggles with each other as brothers and sisters, that you would help us restore those. That if we need to talk to somebody, we would talk to them. Not to everybody else. That we go to them and say, hey, this, you, I feel like you sinned against me here. Can we talk about that? Lord, help us to fight for relationships, not brush them aside. They matter. They're hard because we're all broken. We're all hard to live with. But yet you care about them and you've called us to care about them too. So Lord, give us strength through your spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name.